While the sun was setting, verse 40 says, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And laying his hands on each one of them, he was healing them. So he's in the process of healing all these that have diseases. Remember, Jesus is filled with the Holy Spirit. And he's able to do this. Demons also were coming out of many, shouting, you are the Son of God. Now, is what those demons were saying, is that true? Yes. But notice Jesus' reaction. But rebuking them, he would not allow them to speak because they knew him to be the Christ. Jesus could not be perceived as accepting testimony of demons. That's one reason why he rebuked them and did not allow them to speak. But notice also the fact that today you've got a lot of people who, wants, who want to seek the spirit world. They want to be involved in seances and some sort of trances and try to know what the spirit world says and try to see what they would have to say. But Jesus refused the spirits to speak. Those who wish to follow after Jesus, yet who want to know what the spirit world says, need to take notice of that. Now, of course, no one can communicate with the spirit world today. Harry Houdini was one of the most famous magicians that has ever lived. And he told his wife that if I ever die, and when I do die, he said, then you'll, uh, if you want to communicate with me, then this phrase is what you need to uh, to listen for. Of course, Houdini never believed that you could communicate with the spirit world because he always debunked those claims. But as it turned out, much later after Houdini had passed away, there was someone who surreptitiously found out that information and tried to pull a fast one over on Houdini's wife, but then she caught on to it. Well, there's a lot of people that claim that you can communicate with the spirit world, but that is simply not the case. Uh, no one can today. But Jesus did not allow these spirits to talk. When day came, verse 42, Jesus left and went to a secluded place. And the crowds were searching for him and came to him and tried to keep him from going away from them. You know our Lord had to rest? Even Jesus had to have time of resting. He was a man, 100% man as well as 100% the Son of God. But his physical body needed rest from time to time. And so Jesus occasionally would go off into a secluded place. But he was so popular and his fame had grown so wide at this early stage that they would just not allow him any moment. He was, for lack of a better term, a celebrity at this point in his ministry. That's not what Jesus was looking for by any means. But because of his teaching, because of the miracles that he performed, he, at this point, had a wide popularity among the people. And, but verse 43, but he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. He had to go to a lot of different areas to preach in Palestine. So he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Jesus was a regular visitor to the synagogues. He was a regular attender at the synagogues. And he participated in the worship in those synagogues. Hebrews 2.12 talks about in the midst of the congregation, I will sing praise unto you. That's, of course, a messianic prophecy from the book of Psalms. But as the late Rex Turner pointed out, that also indicates the fact that Jesus worshipped in those synagogues. And part of synagogue worship was singing. Jesus sang. We know that from not only those indications, but also, if you recall from Matthew's account, when they are in the, in, the, oh, in the upper room, and it says when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus and his disciples sang together. So Jesus worshipped in those synagogues, and he preached in those synagogues in Judea. That brings us to chapter 5. Before we get there, though, is there any questions or comments before we move forward? All right, chapter 5, verse 1. Now it happened. We're not told how, how much time elapses between chapters 4 and 5. Luke just says, now it happened. That while the crowd was pressing around him 
and listening to the word of God. He was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. Sea of Galilee is where he is. Think about it. Picture this in your head. Jesus is preaching. He's preaching the word of God and the crowd is pressing around him. He's got a multitude of people. We're not told exactly how many, but it's a large number of people that's standing around him. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. Uh, so Jesus catches the attention, or his, the, these boats catch his attention, that is. And he's wanting to communicate with these individuals. Verse 3, And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. Now, that's how big this crowd was, pressing around him at the edge of the lake. And so Jesus is looking for a place where he could actually teach and get away from the crowd. So he gets in that boat, sits down, which is a normal teaching posture, and he begins to teach from the boat to the people that's on the bank. Now, we know that water is a natural, uh, uh, in other words, it can, sound travels, travels faster uh, on water or underwater as well. So Jesus is using this to assist him as he's, as he's speaking. So he's teaching the people from the boat, verse 4. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Now remember, Simon and his group were fishermen. They were fishermen by profession. That's how they made their money. Notice Simon's reaction. This is a typical fisherman's reaction, if you know anything about fishing. Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing. <laughs> you ever been fishing any? You know that when you've had a day where you hadn't caught a thing, you're ready to pack it up and go to the house. You're not going to catch anything. But, he says, I will do as you say and let down the nets. This is one of those instances where I wish we could have an audio recording of Peter to hear the tone of his voice as he's saying this. I imagine it like this. Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. <laughs> Peter's convinced they're not going to catch anything else, in other words. But he has so much respect for Jesus at this point, he calls him master, which is, a, uh, which is of course, a noble term. He, descri he, uh, he uh, uh, displays a noble attitude. He's willing to do what Jesus says. At your word, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, the nets would go underneath the boat, of course. It would gather up the fish, and they would pull those nets in. They enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. Have you ever caught a mess of fish? You know what a mess of fish is. That's a whole bunch of fish. That's a passel. If you know what a passel of fish is, then you know what a mess of fish is. And don't tell me to define exactly how many. It's just a bunch. He had a mess of fish and then some. And those nets, those nets that were strong nets were about to break. That's a lot. That's a lot of weight on those nets. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. So they're going to put out another net to try to give support to the net they already have. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. Think about this. There's so many fish that the boats are now starting to go under. And Peter just is overwhelmed with all of this. When Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. You know, we all identify with Simon Peter, don't we? Peter's just like us. That is, Peter recognizes his own shortcomings. He knows where he falls short. And he realizes when he's in the presence of deity that his first inclination is to fall at his feet and worship. And that's what Peter's realizing. This is more than just a man to do this kind of miracle. It was performed in his boat 
with his nets, and it was regarding his business. It hit Peter right to the heart. To see all this take place, very natural reaction. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. In all of their years of fishing and making a living, they had never seen, I almost grant you, they had never seen this many fish caught in one sitting. And yet here it is. They've got all this fish that's going to provide their livelihood for a long period of time, apparently. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon, James and John, not the last time we're going to see them. And of course, John would later write the gospel, which bears his name. He would write the epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He would also pen the last book of the Bible, Revelation. At this point, John likely is about 18 to 21 years of age, the youngest disciple by far that Jesus had. He and his brother James, who would go on, by the way, to be the first martyr in the church. He would be put to death, as, we, as is recorded in the book of Acts. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear. From now on you will be catching men. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. You will be catching men. The King James says, you will be fishers of men. How appropriate is that? You've been catching fish up to this point. I've got you involved in a greater work, far greater work. And isn't that what the work we ought to be involved in as Christians? Our number one mission is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, and that begins right here at home, doesn't it? It begins not only here at home, it begins with our own household, making sure our house is what it ought to be, and then expanding outward to our friends and our co-workers and our neighbors and our acquaintances. From now on, you will catch men. You will be fishers of men. We've got to have the desire to fish for men. We've got to have the patience to fish for men. We've got to use the right bait to fish for men. You see where this is going, don't you? We've got to have the desire. We need to have the desire to win souls. Just like you have a desire to catch fish, you've got to have a desire to win souls. You've got to have the patience. If you ever do, do any fishing, you realize how much patience is involved. There are some days that you'll get out of the river or you get out on a lake and just as soon as you put out that, that fly rod or as soon as you put out that bait, you got a, a bite, and you start catching fish. Then there are some days you go out, and you won't get one bite at all, all day. So you're going to have days where you're not going to be successful. You're going to have days where you're very successful, and you're going to have days where you're moderately successful. That's the same way in fishing for men. You're going to have some times where it seems like no one is biting. No one is being attracted to the gospel. Then there are some points in your life where it seems like every time you teach and every time you preach, you've got responses. And then there are some times where it just seems like it's average. It's the kind of field that we're dealing with. And then you've got to use the right bait. You can't fish effectively unless you've got the right bait. If you fish for catfish, for example, you've got to have the stinkiest bait ever, I guarantee you, because that's what draws them. And then if you fish for other kinds of fish, you use minnows or you use worms or you use uh, the fake, uh, the artificial lures. It depends on what kind of fish you want to catch. Well, with the gospel, that's the bait. That's the bait that lures in the souls. And we need to use that. Jesus was interested in fishing, and he's interested in souls, and we've got to be interested in souls too. So, they left everything. They left behind their livelihood to follow after Jesus. It was worth that, to leave the means of making money to follow after the Lord. While he was in one of the cities, that's the cities of Galilee, behold, there was a man covered with leprosy. Leprosy. That was, at this point, an incurable disease. It was a death sentence. If someone had leprosy, he was condemned. 
not only condemned to die physically because there was no cure, he was also condemned to die socially because he would be an outcast. The law of Moses made it very clear that a leper was unclean. And so if someone caught leprosy, then he's done. That was the natural reaction to it. This leprosy that this man had was either severe psoriasis or most likely it was elephantiasis, the last stage of it. The way it sounds, he was in his last stages. He was covered with leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean if you are willing. Leprosy is covered in the law of Moses on several, on, in several places. Among them, Leviticus chapter 13, Numbers chapter 12, and of course we read about Naaman, the Syrian, who was healed of his leprosy by the prophet in 2 Kings chapter 5. So he was willing to follow Jesus, or at least to do what Jesus says, to be cleansed. And he stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him. Now what healed this man? Was it the touching that Jesus did? I don't think so. It was his word. The word of Jesus is what healed him. But the touching that Jesus did, he touched him, was significant. There's no telling how long it had been since this man had had someone actually touch him. He had, had not had any physical contact with anyone for a period of time. And Jesus reaches out his hand and touches him and says, I am willing. He reassures him. He's willing to do what this man wants him to do. And then he commands the leprosy to be cleansed. And immediately, notice, there was no lengthy period of time. There was not some kind of probation period. Immediately, the leprosy left him. And he ordered him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing just as Moses commanded as a testimony to them. This is referring to Leviticus 14, verses 4 through 22, where Moses, through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, includes the process by which a leper could be legally clean. That indicates to me that the Lord, that is, that God, was anticipating the fact that lepers would at some point be healed. And they had to have a process to go through if they were Israelite, to be able to be legally clean of that disease. So he tells him not to tell anyone, but notice what happens, verse 15. But the news about him was spreading even farther, and large crowds were gathering to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. It's not just this. It's what Jesus is doing overall. His news, or the news about him, is spreading farther and farther. But Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. Jesus had to have his time by himself. We have to have our own time by ourselves, don't we? Jesus had to have time to himself to rest and also to pray. Jesus was a man of prayer. How much more must we become people of prayer? One day he was teaching. Now again, we're not told how much time elapses between him healing this leper and what's about to take place. Likely after several weeks is when this happens. And there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there who had come from every, every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. Now this speaks, initially speaks well of these Pharisees and teachers of the law. They were coming to hear Jesus. They were in an honored position. They were sitting down in this place. 
and they were there to hear him. They were at this initial stage willing to have an open mind, at least as far as they could, to listen to what Jesus had to say. His fame had already spread. They had heard about him. They wanted to go hear him themselves. And some men were carrying on a bed a man who was paralyzed. And they were trying to bring him in and to set him down in front of him. Mark's account tells us that this man who was paralyzed was born of four. Four men were carrying him. So there's five men total. The man who's paralyzed who was on a bed and the four men who were carrying him on this bed. They're trying to get into this house. Other gospel accounts tell us it's a house where Jesus is. So they're trying to get into the house to bring him before Jesus because they thought Jesus can heal him. But notice the dilemma but not finding any way to bring him in because of the crowd. They went up on the roof and led him down through the tiles with his stretcher into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. For these men, it was now or never. It's either now or we're never going to be able to have this opportunity again. They're trying to figure out in their mind, how can we get him in there to Jesus? And so one of them has the bright idea, we're not told which one, Let's go up on the roof because we can break up part of that roof and let him down through that roof. It was fairly easy to do the way that houses were built in Galilee and Palestine in the first century. So they go up on top of the house and they break up the tiles big enough to let him down. Most likely they had some rope available where they were able to uh, wrap it around the bed in some fashion and lower him down. And they lower him down. Now think about this. Jesus is inside the house teaching. The Pharisees, the doctors, the law, the teachers of the law are sitting in front of him. All this crowd around. And all of a sudden they're hearing this sound up on the roof. And you can just see them looking up. And all of a sudden here comes this man on a bed being lowered down. Now that's an amazing sight to behold. So now, here he is in front of Jesus. And notice what Luke writes in verse 20. Seeing their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven you. Whose faith did Jesus see? He saw their faith, the men who had lowered the paralytic down. We're not told that he saw his faith, that is, this man who was sick of the palsy, this man who was a paralytic. No, seeing their faith, the men who had lowered him down. Then he tells the man who is paralyzed, friend, your sins are forgiven you. Now you can see the shock on the faces of the, scri of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They're stunned given what they say in response. Verse 21, the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, their logic was not faulty, but their premises were. No one can forgive sins but God, yes. But, this person that's standing or sitting in front of them was not a mere man. He was and is the Son of God. That's what was lost upon them. But Jesus, aware of their reasonings, notice this, he was aware of their reasonings. They did not say this openly. They didn't verbalize what Luke records. They were thinking this, they were reasoning Jesus, aware of the reasonings, answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Now that was a stunner to them, you can imagine. They're thinking this, and then Jesus says, Why are you reasoning this in your hearts? That took them aback, I'm sure. Which is easier, to say your sins have been forgiven you, or to say get up and walk? Which, indeed, which is easier? But, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up and pick up your stretcher and go home. 
That right there is a very significant passage. Notice, that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. When Jesus was on this earth in his physical form, he had the authority to forgive anyone in any manner in which he chose. And he exercised that authority here. Not only here, but later on when he's on the cross, what does he say to the thief? He said, today you will be with me in paradise. He had that authority. Now, after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, people are only forgiven of sins if they obey his great commission. He gave the great commission shortly before his ascension, and he specified the manner in which people must receive forgiveness of sins. Belief and baptism. Belief, repentance, and baptism. Which, of course, we read about in the book of Acts. So those people today that say, I'm going to be saved just like the thief on the cross are missing the point. Jesus was still living up when he was hanging on the cross. He still had the authority on earth to forgive sins. He has that authority. He forgave the thief. We're going to see later on when we get to that point. I believe the thief was a backsliding Israelite, but we'll get there once we get there. Still the fact is, Jesus has that authority. He had that authority. Now, today, we're only forgiven of sin through obedience to the gospel of Christ, which includes baptism for the forgiveness of sins. But here, in this occasion, Jesus knew this man had a far greater need than just being healed of his paralysis. He needed forgiveness of sin. Apparently, the man was willing to be forgiven of sin. And the men who were with him were willing to do what the Lord said. And so, verse 25 says, Immediately he got up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. Immediately. He didn't start stumbling up and staggering around and tottering. No. Immediately got up, picked up his bed, gone. Glorifying God. There was no question about this healing. None whatsoever. They were all struck with astonishment and began glorifying God and they were filled with fear saying, we have seen remarkable things today. You better believe they did. This was a threefold miracle. Number one, Jesus read their thoughts. That was miraculous. Number two, the paralytic was healed. That was miraculous. But the third thing was the fact that this man Jesus had forgiven the sins of the man who was sick. That had never been done before. No one who had been living among them had ever said, your sins are forgiven you because no one had that authority. And yet here he is and he declares, I do have that authority. And he forgave his sins. Those are remarkable things. And they were all filled, of course, as the text says, with amazement. Any questions or comments about this before we move forward? All right. Verse 27. After that, again, we're not told how long the time lapse is. He went out and noticed a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he left everything behind and got up and began to follow him. Levi, in this occasion, is Matthew. We're familiar with him as Matthew. Prior to this, Matthew had already been following as far as being a disciple of Jesus, but he had not at this point, but to this point, left everything behind. He does now. He had to settle his accounts. And so we assume by implication that he did that. He got up and began to follow him. And Levi gave a big reception for him in his house. And there was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with them. Levi apparently decides, I've got the means to do it. And before I leave uh, to follow Jesus, let's throw him a party as it is. A feast, a reception. The Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling at his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? 
Oh boy. This is not going to be the last time that this comes up with Jesus. You are actually eating with all of these despised tax collectors. You've got these sinners around you. Oh, this offends their self-esteem. You know, it offends their sense of decorum. And Jesus answered and said to them, it is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That's something that needs never be lost with us. We must never lose that fact. Jesus calls the sinners to repentance. The great physician now is near. The sympathizing Jesus we often sing. Do we really think about the implications of that? When you get sick, you need a doctor, don't you? All of us do. We don't like to go to the doctor when we're sick, but we have to. We need to be healed. When we are sin sick, and there's a lot of sin sickness around us, pay attention, open your eyes, you'll see all the sin sickness going around. People need the great physician. They need Jesus. They need his healing, and he can bring it. He can change lives. He can transform attitudes. He can transform people. And that's what our old world needs more than anything else right now. All of what's going on around the world, politically, militarily, morally, you name it, the one need above everything else is the Lord and his salvation. And that's what Jesus still is calling the sinners to do. He's calling the sinners to repentance. And they said to him, verse 33, the disciples of John often fast and offer prayers. The disciples of the Pharisees also do the same. But yours eat and drink. What's going on with that? In other words, you, we see the disciples of John, they fast, they pray. We you see the disciples of the Pharisees, they're fasting, they're praying, and your disciples, they eat and drink just as if everything's normal. Jesus said to them, you cannot make the attendance of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? But the days will come, and when the bridegroom is taken away from them, then they will fast in those days. Ah, okay. While Jesus is with them, they're going to enjoy being with him. They're going to celebrate. They're going to eat and drink. But there's going to come a time where Jesus has taken away his death, burial, and then resurrection. Then he's ascended back to the Father. Then, he says, they will fast in those days. And he is also telling them a parable. No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, he will both tear the new and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled out and the skins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, wishes for new, for he says the old is good enough. What's Jesus saying? He is saying that he is not merely reforming the Mosaic system. He's not putting a patch on the Mosaic system. He's not putting this old or this new wine, his teaching, into old wineskins, the Mosaic system. He is coming in to bring in his system. The gospel system. New wine and new wineskins. It's going to be a completely new system. That was lost, of course, on the Pharisees. It was lost on the scribes and the teachers. But that's what Jesus is referring to. Now, some of my brethren today want to say that these new wine and the new wineskins means we've got to change things in the church. We don't need to be bogged down in the 1950s and 1960s. We need to reform everything to make it up to date and modern and, and make sure that uh, people aren't offended by us. And what they mean by that is let's change what we're teaching. Let's change what we're doing in worship. And let's radically change it to something that you can't really find in the New Testament. Well, that's exactly not what Jesus is talking about. 
is not what he's talking about. He's talking about his teaching, which would be the gospel, cannot be put into old wineskins, that is, the mosaic system. There's coming a time when that's going to be gone. And this new system is coming in. So that's what he's referring to. And we need not ever to lose sight of that. Any questions or comments before we get into chapter 6? Y'all are real quiet this morning. That's fine, though. Chapter 6, y'all all agree with me completely. That's fantastic, if you believe that. Now it happened that he was passing through some grain fields on the Sabbath. Again, we're not told when. It's just a matter of time takes place. And his disciples were picking the heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands, and eating the grain. But some of the Pharisees said, why do you do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? They're referring to Exodus chapter 20. And Jesus answering them said, have you not even read what David did when he was hungry? That's from 1 Samuel 21 verse 6. How he, uh, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and took and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for any to eat except the priest alone, that refers to Leviticus 24, and gave it to his companions. And he was saying to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now again, some of my brethren look at this passage and say, you see, Jesus is endorsing something which is completely against the law of Moses, so he's going to let us do things that are not necessarily explicitly stated in the New Testament that we have considered up to this point unlawful. Jesus allows for liberty for that, but that's missing the point of what Jesus says. He is saying the Son of Man is Lord of Sabbath. Jesus is the Son of God. He was the one who inspired Moses to write what he did. And what David did was he was running for his life, he and his companions, and they were starving to death. And so they took some of that bread to eat. As Jesus will point out later, there are certain things, mercy, that transcend other things. In this case, David and his companions had to live. They had to survive. And so they did this. There was an exception made for them, yes. But the fact is, this is not indicating that Jesus is going to endorse us when we completely go against what he has said in his word. That's not the point of what Jesus is saying here. He says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus can determine what's right and what's wrong. We have no right to determine that. Jesus does. And he does do that. Well, we're about out of time. So I'm sure there will be more to discuss about this section next Sunday morning. And of course, the section right after this, which is dealing with the Sabbath as well. This is going to be a reoccurring problem that comes up. Not a problem for the Lord, but a problem for the Pharisees and the scribes to get past. That is Jesus and the Sabbath. And that is used against him quite often. So we're going to be looking at that beginning next Sunday morning.